Us conspiring to incite a riot. Hell no, we won't go. Hell no, we won't go. American justice would be called upon to determine who was responsible, police or protesters. The riots that shocked America in August 1968 were part of a chain reaction stretching halfway around the globe. From a war in Vietnam that was tearing the nation apart. And I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. To the assassination in April of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Which sparked race riots around the country. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. To the slaying in June of presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy, who opposed the Vietnam War. But the chain reaction was not yet complete. It would explode in Chicago in late August as the Democrats were nominating a new candidate for president. President Johnson, weary of waging an increasingly unpopular war, had already bowed out of the race. I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Into this political chaos stepped some of the best-known radicals in America. For Jerry Rubin, co-founder of the Youth International Party, or Yippies, the Chicago Convention presented the perfect opportunity to take a high-profile televised stand. Large-scale demonstrations against LBJ's war in Vietnam and the establishment. Because the Democratic Party has blood on its hands. And because there's a struggle going on in the world today between young people and between those old menopausal men who run this country. One of the more traditional protest leaders actually belonged to the older generation. David Dellinger was 52, a pacifist who had opposed the draft as far back as World War II. I want to be very clear, of course, we are nonviolent. We're not going to attack the, uh, the National Guard. We're not going to attack the police. We believe that our fight is not with them. Our fight is with the militarist and uh, racist policies of the government. In the weeks leading up to the convention, Jerry Rubin and his Yippie co-founder, Abby Hoffman, both born showmen, regaled the media with their mock agendas. The Chicago water supply would be contaminated with LSD. Wives of delegates would be seduced away from their husbands by young radicals and driven across the border to Wisconsin. More ominously, the FBI was warning Chicago police about the possibility of assassinations and terrorism. The reports noted that some of the anti-war activists were communists who supported the North Vietnamese. In stereotypical 1960s fashion, the battle lines were being drawn. Young protesters against the old establishment. All in favor of that motion will signify by saying aye. Aye. No one better personified the establishment than Chicago's longtime mayor, Richard J. Daley, a prominent figure in national politics and a loyal Democratic Party power broker. This was his convention in his heavily Democratic city. He did not want any disruptive protests, so he steadfastly refused to grant organizers the permits they were requesting. We don't permit our own people to sleep in the park, so why would we permit anyone from out of the city to sleep in the park? We don't permit our own people to march at night, so why would we permit a lot of people doing snake dances at night through neighborhoods? Protest organizer Rennie Davis, one of those later charged with conspiring to incite a riot, would not back down. If the mayor uh, refuses to grant these permits, uh, we believe uh, that citizens of this country should, oppo should oppose a police state and martial law and uh, should come to the city of Chicago uh, determined to have this demonstration. The nation's best known young radical, Tom Hayden, co-founder of SDS, or Students for a Democratic Society, was equally defiant. So in other words, you're willing to be arrested, is that it? Uh, it's not simply a question of being able to uh, assemble 
but also a question of being able to assemble with the reasonable hope that the 5,000 troops from Fort Hood, the 6,000 Illinois National Guardsmen, the 12,000 Chicago policemen, the 1,000 secret agents, the 8,000 canisters of mace and all the rest of us will not be used against us. It was clear that if we went, there would be some kind of confrontation. If we didn't go, it was like giving up the right to protest because we'd been intimidated. So we, we went not knowing from day to day what was going to happen. As protesters began gathering in Chicago parks, a federal judge rejected the demonstrators' appeal for permits to sleep in the parks and marched to the convention hall. Illinois National Guardsmen and police stood ready to enforce the law, including an 11 p.m. curfew in the parks, a curfew that would become the proverbial line drawn in the sand. The threat of violent confrontation was growing. Protest organizers now offered training in martial arts, a precaution, perhaps, but to nervous authorities, it appeared to be one more provocation. Equally provocative were the so-called snake dances, a Japanese paramilitary formation. Arriving demonstrators were referring to police by a name that was bound to raise tensions even higher. They called them pigs, you know, and it's, uh, it was uh, Allen Ginsberg, uh, the poet, uh, took issue with his own people and said, you call a man a pig, you're going to bring the pig out in him. With passions rising every day, Chicago police officials, including spokesman Frank Sullivan, were increasingly suspicious of the protest organizers and their motives. It was an attempt by a small group of radicals to have a confrontation with the police department, which they thought would advance their political cause, which was to discredit the government of the United States of America. On the day before the official start of the convention, the Yippies, risking retaliation from the police, tried to hold their first planned event, a music festival in Lincoln Park, for which they had no permit. Police shut it down. It was the opening salvo. By that afternoon, Sunday, August 25th, the crowds in Lincoln Park were getting increasingly restless and angry. Angry at police, but also with their own leaders, who had assured them they would get permission to march and to stay in the park. At 11 p.m., police enforcing the city curfew began herding the demonstrators out of the park. One group of protesters defied the police by re-entering the park and refusing to budge. They suddenly gave new meaning to a standard anti-draft slogan. But eventually, police used force to push the crowds onto the streets, where, by press and eyewitness accounts, some police overreacted. Suddenly, they started attacking anybody in sight, trying to scare them, clubbing them, if they could reach them. Uh, and there was this kind of surges of panic up and down the street as uh, people uh, tried to get away from the uh, clubbing cops. <laughs> police thought their behavior was justified. I don't understand this naivety that uh, people think they can illegally touch policemen, push policemen, shout at policemen, call them names, and um, everything is going to be um, peaceful. I advise obeying policemen. The battle between police and protesters Sunday night was just a hint of the trouble ahead on the streets of Chicago. Violence that would lead to federal indictments against eight protest leaders for inciting a riot. The demonstrators in Chicago would chant, the whole world is watching. And so it was. I was among the observers, then a young reporter for the CBS station in Chicago, WBBM-TV. It's become a cliche that America in the 60s experienced a crisis of authority. Every institution was under attack. The military, education, journalism, and certainly American justice. On the streets of Chicago in late August 1968, the crisis reached an unforgettably theatrical climax. Both sides, police and protesters, were spoiling for a fight. 
As the scuffles rapidly turned into a riot, I remember the sense of fear that maybe the country really was splitting down the middle and might not survive this crisis. A crisis that would play itself out not only on the streets, but eventually in the courtroom. American justice will return in a moment here on a and &E. Yeah, my plane was... They can take on a life and a logic of their own and charge towards some violent climax, the size and shape of which no one, neither police nor protesters, can foresee. That was certainly the case in Chicago during the Democratic Convention in August 1968. As the convention kicked off, more than 10,000 demonstrators were in the streets and parks. There were 12,000 police and 6,000 National Guardsmen. On both sides of the barricades, there was a mood of bitter defiance. One policeman displayed a chunk of concrete thrown by a demonstrator that hit this officer in the face. This reporter described being assaulted by police. At that time, he noticed that I was taping the uh, whole proceedings. He then grabbed my microphone and ripped it off the machine here and uh, slapped me up against the side of the head on the left side when my helmet was on with the billy club, with the billy club knocking the helmet off. And then when the, while the helmet was off, he then uh, cracked me on the right side of the head. Inside the convention hall, a fierce battle over the Vietnam War. People want peace. They, this war is wrong. A battle the demonstrators outside were following closely to see if their view, immediate American withdrawal from Southeast Asia, would win the support of the Democratic Party. In the end, it would not. Monday, August 26th, the riot was gathering momentum. Demonstrators tried to march to Chicago police headquarters to protest the arrest of anti-war activist Tom Hayden. They were turned away. Hayden had been charged with trying to let the air out of the tire of a police car. He was released on bail. This is the kind of thing which escalates an already tense situation, which convinces our people that this was an act of political persecution and certainly uh, um, can lead to future difficulties. The difficulties were in fact very immediate. Hundreds of angry protesters now swarmed into Grant Park, downtown. Some leaped onto the statue, appropriately enough, of a Civil War hero, General John Logan. They hoisted Viet Cong flags. Police charged up the hill and yanked people off the statue. One young man refused to come down. But he still would not budge. Police began beating him. They forced him off the statue, breaking his arm in the process. That night, a repeat of the violent ritual in the park, as police again tried to enforce the 11 p.m. curfew. When demonstrators refused to obey the law and leave, police fired tear gas into the crowd. For those who had organized the protests, whether they intended to incite a riot or not, this was exactly the kind of primetime media exposure they had hoped for. In fact, the violence in the streets was throwing the convention into chaos. I feel very strongly that uh, we cannot nominate a president under the kind of conditions that are occurring in uh, the streets of Chicago at this time. The next day, Tuesday, featured an event planned by the demonstrators, a speech in Lincoln Park by Black Panther chairman Bobby Seale. It would later be cited by authorities in charging Seal with inciting a riot. According to press accounts, Seal told the crowd of 2,000 angry protesters, if a pig comes up to us and starts swinging a billy club, and you check around and see you've got your peace, you got to down that pig in defense of yourself. Because if you pull it out and shoot it well, all I'm going to do is pat you on the back and say, keep shooting. That night, about 4,000 people, once again kicked out of Lincoln Park, streamed back downtown, led by organizer Rennie Davis. Busloads of policemen moved in to protect the Conrad Hilton Hotel, the Democratic Party headquarters. 
Fearing another outbreak of violence, the police told the crowds they could spend the night at Grant Park, across the street from the Hilton. In my judgment, it would be foolish for the police to try and uh, move this crowd. There are children there, there are women there. Later that night, Tom Hayden, wearing a disguise to evade arrest, told the crowd that, permit or no permit, there would be a march to the convention hall the following day, Wednesday, the day Hubert Humphrey was to be nominated for president. Tensions built through the night. As 600 National Guardsmen arrived in full battle gear to relieve Chicago police. Bayonets, flamethrowers, M1s. The crowds chanted, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil. Wednesday morning, calm before another storm. The next 24 hours of rioting would forever fix the image of a city, a political party, and a nation in chaos. Protesters were streaming into Grant Park for a well-advertised legal rally. As many as 15,000 showed up to hear the angry anti-war speeches. There you go. I don't give a damn about this country. Because this damn country ain't did nothing for me. There were 600 police officers around the band shell. Police intelligence had warned that militant protesters planned to invade downtown Chicago and wreak havoc. Police helicopters circled above, warning people they would be arrested if they tried to march out of the park. Chicago's Mayor Daley feared that the protesters would invade the convention hall and disrupt the proceedings on national television. Jerry Rubin provoked the crowd by urging whites to join blacks and become fighters in the streets. See you on the streets tonight, he said. Inside the amphitheater, the Democrats voted down the anti-war plank. The New York delegation held its own protest. Out in Grant Park, word of the anti-war plank's defeat enraged the crowd. At about 3.30 p.m., a teenage boy climbed the flagpole and began to lower the flag. Police pushed their way through the crowd and arrested him. Protesters began pelting the arresting officers with rocks, other debris, even bags of urine. of protesters now surrounded the flagpole, took down the flag, and raised a red t-shirt in its place. Police removed it. The crowd was on its feet trying to see what was going on. Let it down! Let it down! Stop throwing things! They are provoking us, but we do not want to confront them now! Move back, please! Rennie Davis ran over to the flagpole and tried to set up a line of his own marshals between the crowd and the police. Police responded by charging the line of marshals. A group of five angry officers clubbed Davis, beating him unconscious. A battle ensued. leader then called on people to disobey the law and march to the convention hall. A furious Tom Hayden told the crowd that Davis had been rushed to the hospital. He urged them to leave the park in small groups and, as he put it, turn this overheated military machine against itself. Heavily armed National Guardsmen now moved into position to prevent the crowds from moving en masse from the park to the downtown Democratic headquarters at the Conrad Hilton. Chicago police formed their own lines to prevent a march toward the convention hall, more than three miles away. Nonetheless, activist David Dellinger tried to organize protesters into a line and lead his own nonviolent march. Chicago Deputy Superintendent James Rochford arrived and told Dellinger he could not, under any circumstances, lead a march. Finally, a leaderless mob of 7,000 people broke up and began streaming over the bridges toward the Hilton. Some were looking for trouble. Many wanted to march. Others were just trying to leave the area. No, we won't go. No, no, we won't go. Police and guardsmen were confused. 
As people tried to get past police lines, the National Guard fired tear gas. Dazed and frantic demonstrators, many vomiting from the tear gas, now cascaded onto Michigan Avenue, right in front of the Hilton and the network TV crews. At this point, a three-wagon mule train, led by Reverend Ralph Abernathy and the Southern Christian Leadership Council, was making its way down Michigan. Abernathy had a permit to march to the convention hall. Thousands of demonstrators now tried to link up with the mule train. But police had the area surrounded. Protesters taunted police. Some threw rocks and other debris. Police now told the mule train to proceed on its own. Shortly before 8 p.m., police tried to clear the streets. Some policemen lost control and began beating and macing protesters left and right. The next 17 minutes of violence, in which hundreds of people were injured, would come to symbolize Chicago, the Democratic Convention, and the 1960s in America. would later coin the phrase police riot to describe the event, meaning that police, while provoked and attacked by demonstrators, lost control of themselves. I've never heard such animal sounds coming from people as were coming from the cops. They were growling the way you hear growls coming from uh, bears in the movies. By 9.30 that evening, the taped footage was on national television. In the convention hall, Connecticut Senator Abraham Ribicoff, then giving his nomination speech for Senator George McGovern, denounced the violence. And with George McGovern as President of the United States, we wouldn't have to have Gestapo's tactics in the streets of Chicago. The cameras caught the angry reaction of Chicago's proud mayor, cursing Ribicoff an image of the Democratic Party in total disarray. Later that night, Vice President Hubert Humphrey won the nomination on the first ballot. Anti-war delegates protested with a candlelight march down Michigan Avenue, scene of the violence earlier in the evening. The wounded told stories of police brutality. We were down here trying to keep the people moving along, trying to keep them from causing trouble. And I got clubbed over the head. The next day, police displayed objects thrown by demonstrators, and Mayor Daley defended his police department. In the heat of emotion and riot, some pl policemen may have overacted. But to judge the entire police department by the alleged action of a few would be just as unfair as to judge our entire younger generation by the action of this mob. Eight policemen would later be charged with using excessive force. All were acquitted. Hubert Humphrey would go on to lose a close race in November to Richard Nixon, a defeat attributed in large part to the chaos and violence in the streets of Chicago. On that worst day of the rioting, Wednesday, August 28th, Chicago police arrested 308 people. Most were charged with mob action, disorderly conduct, or failure to obey a police order. All state charges. But eight others, the alleged organizers of the riot, would be brought up on federal charges, conspiracy, and inciting a riot. The trial would turn into the most divisive and certainly the most chaotic political trial in the history of American justice. That's next.
the anti-war activists who came to Chicago in August 1968, hoping to publicize their cause, had succeeded in ways they had never dreamed possible. Now American justice would stage a bizarre reenactment of the conflict in a federal courtroom as eight men faced charges for conspiring to incite the riots. David Dellinger, Rennie Davis, Tom Hayden, Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, John Freunds, Lee Weiner, and Bobby Seale. The Chicago Eight. Once again, young protesters pitted against the old establishment. Only this time, the protesters would tangle with a feisty 73-year-old federal judge named Julius Jennings Hoffman. Like Mayor Daley, Hoffman embodied the establishment. He was a small man, sort of looking much, very much like a gargoyle, or like Mr. Magoo. His voice and his appearance were very much like Mr. Magoo. He was a judge who was known for being on the side of the government. He had a kind of Roman faith in the uh, uh, government of the empire, you know, and he dedicated himself to giving it as much support as he could. For his part, defendant Abby Hoffman set a tone of comic defiance. Yippee, the yippies believe in the violation of every law in the books, including the law of gravity. <laughs> that the yippie and the judge shared a last name, Hoffman, no relation, was a frequent cause of levity. And they asked the judge, uh, I forgot his name. Uh, Hoffman. Right. Uh, Judge Hoffman. Uh... Hoffman and fellow Yippie defendant Jerry Rubin put on boxing gloves and challenged the judge to a fair fight instead of a trial. Others, including defendant Tom Hayden, took the proceedings more seriously. He challenged the idea that taunting police amounted to inciting a riot. As for taunting, I've never been told that taunting is illegal. This is what we're accused of by... Many people in the uh, government is precisely this business of taunting, like somehow we'd get a fair trial if we dressed up. Uh, last year, we wouldn't have been attacked by police if we had called them mister. Federal prosecutor Tom Foran said the evidence of provoking the riots went way beyond mere taunting. Things like saying to a group of kids late at night in Lincoln Park, now I want you to go out into the streets and I want you to grab a blue helmeted blankety blank and put them on a morgue slab. Now that's inciting to riot. Each of the eight defendants was charged under a new federal law, crossing state lines with intent to incite a riot. They were also accused as a group with conspiring to violate that law. It's a concept I don't like. I don't think riot should be a legal uh, prosecution uh, availability. I think that it's too easy to charge people with it. No one really quite knows what it is, uh, what is a riot. They were throwing bricks at police vehicles. They broke the windows of some police vehicles. You can't interfere with other people's rights to assert your own. And particularly when you're talking about uh, starting fires and breaking windows and beating up policemen and throwing rocks at public officials and uh, you know, there's no great difficulty in saying what's a riot compared to a peaceable assembly. All the defendants denied that there was any conspiracy to incite a riot. Abby Hoffman kept saying conspiracy. We couldn't agree on lunch. As the trial began on September 24th, 1969, demonstrators filled the streets near Chicago's federal courthouse. Inside, Jean Fritz was picked to be on the jury of 10 women and two men. All the defendants sitting at the table with their beards and their long hair, which was not the style right then, and they were all laughing and talking, and you thought, oh my God, what am I doing here? One of the first battles in the courtroom concerned defendant Bobby Seal. A Black Panther leader refused to accept either of the two defense attorneys as his lawyer. Seal demanded that since his own lawyer, Charles Gary, could not be present at the trial, that he should be allowed to represent himself. Hoffman denied Seal's request and told him to accept William Kunstler as his attorney. The judge would say, you have a lawyer, Mr. Seal. I don't want any white honky lawyer, you blankety, 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 banging and yelling and screaming. And Kunstler would sit there silent. And this went on day day after day, sometimes 
having, making it impossible to get in one ounce of testimony. One month into the trial, Judge Hoffman's patience wore out. He ordered Seal gagged and bound to a chair. When they tied him up and sent us out, we came back, and he's tied up with a gag in his mouth. I started to shake. I couldn't stop shaking. It was horrible. I think it's bad that uh, Malik has to sit in the courtroom and see his father gagged and handcuffed like this. The following week, Judge Hoffman declared a mistrial for Seal. He also cited him for 16 counts of contempt of court and sentenced him to four years in prison. The Chicago 8 were now the Chicago 7. The Bobby Seal incident provoked the other defendants to further acts of defiance. Abby Hoffman stood on his head and blew kisses to the jury. He and Jerry Rubin came to court dressed in judicial robes. Others would refuse to rise when the judge entered the courtroom, anything to thumb their noses at what they perceived to be American injustice. Judge Hoffman was furious. He began making hostile remarks to the defendants and their lawyers that would later be ruled prejudicial. They're trying to get the judge to overdo things, to overstate, uh, because they thought that would generate error in the record. Uh, I, they taunted us, too, uh, and I think I lost my temper at least a couple times. Uh, but uh, it was like going to the dentist and having a root canal every morning is what it was like. In between these disruptions, the government tried to make its case. Prosecutor Foran relied on the testimony of undercover policemen who had infiltrated meetings the defendants held before the riots. They'd have these meetings, and in these meetings, they'd say, Abby, you and uh, Jerry are going to be up in uh, Lincoln Park, and uh, you're going to have such and such a rock group there. 11 o'clock at night when you're supposed to leave the park, build some barricades and tell the cops you're not going to leave. They're trying to make you leave, fight them. The defendants denied the charges. We said, get out of Lincoln Park. <clears throat> when the cops come into Lincoln Park, you have, th there's no human possibility of staying there because they're coming in with orders to kill anybody who tries to stay there. And we don't believe in suicide. Leave the park. That was my position all along. Statements like, uh, if blood is going to be shed, let it be... Uh, uh, shed in the uh, streets in front of the convention where the TV and the delegates are going to see it. Uh, that's something that I said uh, at a time when things were uh, totally at their worst. I said that. Um, but to, to think that that was planned um, a year before or a month before, it wasn't planned a minute before. Defense attorney Kunstler tried to show that the undercover cops were lying on the stand. We had total perjury on the part of the many police officers who testified. One who said he saw a couple making love in a tree, which, uh, and I cross-examined him, and uh, I couldn't conceive of how they could make love in a tree without falling out, you know, or that no one else in Chicago would have noticed it. While the defendants were doing their best to provoke Judge Hoffman, Prosecutor Foran and defense attorney Kunstler were fighting a battle of their own. The prosecutor accused the defense lawyer of acting as if he were one of the defendants. He was not defending them. He was one of them. Uh, he had the same desires they had to uh, disrupt the legal process, to keep it from uh, coming to fruition, uh, to uh, demean the United States. We wanted to publicize and dramatize why the defendants were there, what they stood for. And so we did things uh, like having a Viet Cong flag on our table, uh, like standing and reading the names of the dead on moratorium day, bringing Bobby Seale a birthday cake, uh, and so on. In closing arguments, Prosecutor Foran reminded the jury that the defendants were not kids, but the youngest of them, Rennie Davis, was 29. The oldest, David Dellinger, 53. They were a bunch of sophisticated older men who hated the country and hated the United States and conned a bunch of kids into joining them in this uh, counterculture protest. But when Foran went on to call the defendants evil men, the audience and the defendants broke into laughter. On Valentine's Day, 1970, after a four-and-a-half-month trial, the jury retired. No matter what they did, their decision would be viewed as symbolic. Convict 
and they would be upholding the views of the old establishment, a quit, and they would be giving their blessing to the leaders of an anti-war protest that, for whatever reasons, turned violent. There were a few moments during the trial when both sides actually shared a laugh. I recall vividly the day Mayor Daly was set to testify. Before the judge entered the courtroom, defendant Abby Hoffman stood up. He turned toward the mayor and pretended to reach for a six-shooter in a holster. Okay, Mr. Mayor, he said, why don't you and I just shoot it out and get this whole thing over with? The mayor didn't say a word to Hoffman, but he did laugh heartily. The verdict in the Chicago conspiracy trial when American justice returns in a moment. You have a 30-year mortgage. Lay Demonstrators scuffled with police outside Chicago's federal courthouse in February 1970. Inside, the jury was ready to consider the fate of the famed Chicago 7. But Judge Julius Hoffman was not planning to wait for a jury verdict to sentence the defendants and their lawyers for contempt of court. 159 counts in all. The longest sentence went to defense attorney William Kunstler, four years and 13 days. I may not be the greatest lawyer in the world, but I think that I am at this moment, along with my colleague Leonard Weinglass, the most privileged, being punished for what we believe in. Judge Hoffman gave Abby Hoffman eight months, Rennie Davis and Jerry Rubin two years each. The jury's not out of the room for, for a minute, and he starts sentencing us to jail. He can't even wait for the lunch break. Judge Hoffman represents all that is old, all that is ugly, all that is bigoted, all that is repressive in America. Inside the jury room, deep divisions on the riot and conspiracy charges. Eight to convict, four to acquit. A deadlock. Juror Jean Fritz wanted to acquit on all charges. From the very start, she and three other jurors came under fierce attack from the majority. We didn't know what we were talking about. And uh, the only reason I wanted them freed was because I had a daughter who was in college and she was a hippie and things like that. Jean Fritz was upset. She felt deeply that the prosecution of the seven men was a dangerous attack on free speech. I would get days when I was a, I was a total wreck on that jury. I, w I would shake. I would be so upset and, uh, and afraid. And I didn't want to be afraid of my own government. The jury sent Judge Hoffman a note saying they were hung. When the judge receives a message like that, he is supposed to impanel both sides, the, uh, the prosecution and the defense, and discuss the message. Uh, the Judge Hoffman did not do that. Judge Hoffman suppressed the message. Hoffman came back and he said, you'll sit there as long as you possibly can because you're not getting out of here until you decide what you're going to do. Finally, on the fifth day of deliberations, the four jurors who wanted to acquit gave in. They agreed to find five of the seven defendants, Hayden, Dellinger, Davis, Rubin, and Hoffman, guilty of crossing state lines with intent to incite a riot, but not guilty of conspiracy. Two defendants, John Freunds and Lee Weiner, acquitted on all charges. The jurors who thought the Chicago 7 were innocent justified their compromise by saying a partial guilty verdict was at least better than a hung jury, because a hung jury would have left prosecutors the option of trying the case again. That was one of the main reasons we compromised. We figured that they would give them another trial, and we figured with the atmosphere the way it was, they wouldn't have a chance, because everybody hated them. The judge then sentenced each of the five men to five years in prison. The prosecutor said the guilty verdicts were a victory for American justice over the disruptive behavior of the defendants, both inside and outside the courtroom. As a judge, we have established as best that we could that they simply could not do in the courtroom in the last four and a half months what they, what they did and attempted to do in one week during the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Defiant to the end, defendant Jerry Rubin told the judge, Julius, you radicalized more young people than we ever could. You're the country's top yippee. But American justice had not seen the last of the Chicago 7 case. 
First, Judge Hoffman's numerous contempt of court verdicts, all reversed on appeal, including those against Bobby Seale. The court said that since Judge Hoffman was the target of the courtroom attacks, he should not have sat in judgment of them. Next, the appeals court overturned the five convictions for inciting a riot because of errors by the judge and the prosecutors. Among the errors, the court cited Judge Hoffman's antagonistic attitude toward the defense. Prosecutor Foran still defends Judge Hoffman. I've tried a lot of cases before a lot of judges. There is no judge who could have conducted that trial without disruption. Just like the Chicago police during the riots, the judge fell into the trap of letting himself become a target for anyone seeking a symbol of the evil establishment. But the case was not quite over. The government still wanted to get some of the defendants and attorney William Kunstler on contempt charges. That's next. Let the Chicago conspiracy trial. In the end, the protest leaders who took on the establishment at the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago were vindicated by that very establishment. The system of American justice, which they had railed against as corrupt and unfair, overturned their convictions for inciting a riot. Yet the Chicago demonstrators did not appear to have won over the public. To the great surprise of the demonstrators, 80% uh, of Americans polled said they disapproved of the demonstration tactics and they blamed the demonstrators rather than the police for what had happened. The government still wanted to punish the Chicago 7 defendants and their lawyers for their defiant behavior in the courtroom. Such disrespect for the rules, said prosecutors, cannot be tolerated. Attorney Kunstler argued the disobedience was justified. But these defendants were determined not to be hampered by the rules, particularly when they thought the rules were those of a system which was out to destroy them by any means necessary. But in November 1973, the government retried the contempt of court charges and won. Anti-war leaders David Dellinger, Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, and attorney William Kunstler all found guilty. Well, I just want to say that the judge blew it. U.S. Attorney James Thompson explained his motive in retrying the case. But simply to vindicate what we consider to be the most important interest there is in the administration of criminal justice. And that is that the rule of law and the rule of civility prevail in a courtroom over the rule of anarchy and the rule of violence. But the court said the judge and prosecutor in the original trial had to share the blame with the defendants. So no jail time was ordered. Attorney Kunstler said he had brought his toothbrush with him just in case. It is a relief not to be able to use that toothbrush within the walls of the Cook County Jail. It had been five years since the riots, four years since the trial began. Kunstler came away from it all with a much darker view of American justice. After Chicago, I knew the government was rotten. I knew the whole judicial system was rotten to the core in certain cases and it changed my whole perspective as of how, essentially, to be a lawyer. For police spokesman Frank Sullivan, Chicago 1968 has a much different meeting. The moral of the story is do not create a situation where you have thousands of people in the middle of the street defying the police. Uh, and then later on, don't be surprised if some policemen use their nightsticks and uh, hit people who are defying them. For author John Schultz, eyewitness to both the riots and the trial, the moral was that each side, authorities and protesters, had turned the other into a subhuman enemy. The police uh, bestialized the demonstrators, and the demonstrators in turn bestialized the police. The same thing occurred in the trial, uh, in which the prosecution really tried, in, uh, much more than ordinarily happens in a trial, to bestialize uh, the defendants and everything they stood for. The defense on their turn tried to uh, characterize the uh, prosecution as being really diabolical. Abby Hoffman said it best at the end of the trial, standing there dressed in his red, white, and blue American flag shirt with his long hair. He said, riot, I thought a riot was supposed to be funny. This wasn't fun. Of all the strange things that happened in Judge Hoffman's courtroom, the one that rankles the most in my memory was certainly Hoffman's order that Bobby Seale be bound and gagged. Technically, of course, a legal move. 
but the marshals did not know exactly how to carry out the judge's order. So first, they handcuffed Seal to a metal chair, put tape over his mouth, and carried him into the courtroom. Seal began clanging the cuffs against the chair. The judge was annoyed. He told the marshals, fix it. So they carried Seal back out, this time put him in a wooden chair, tied him down with rope, put cotton over his mouth, covered it with tape, and carried him back into the courtroom. All this when the judge could easily have severed Seal from the trial immediately and avoided such a horrendous display, one that came to symbolize an episode of American justice gone mad. I'm Bill Curtis. Join us again next time for another edition of American Justice here on A&E. Now you can own this four video cassette collector's edition